I think we're about to start. We've had, you might have gathered, we've had some technical problems at the joy of using computers. But anyway, I do welcome you here in the church. I do welcome you on Zoom. You're very welcome. Although you might be a short distance away, you're very much part of the fellowship here, and we do welcome you. And also those who will be on YouTube later on, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. I'd just like to start by reading some verses from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout loud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving, and it's told him with music of song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The mountains speak, peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us be before the Lord, our Maker. You may or may not have noticed that three times in that, those verses it mentions come, and we've come to worship the Lord today. As it says, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. So I invite you to stand and we sing our first song, Beautiful Saviour. And you might, in those words, it reminds us that God hears our cry, that he is our Redeemer, and that heaven awaits us for those who trust in him. So let's stand and sing, Beautiful Saviour. <laughs>
pray. Father, we are reminded in that first psalm that we are to come. And Lord, we have come obedient to your command. We have come because you are the gracious God. You are the everlasting one. You are the one who sustains us through all things. And you are worthy of all praise. Even all creation bows before you and worships you. And we thank you, Father, that we are part of that worship. We might be few in number here, but Lord, as we think around the world today, countless people are reaching in your name to praise you and to worship you. We thank you that we belong to the family of God. We thank you that we, we know you as our Lord and Father, that you wash over us and you care for us. So Father, whether we're here in the church, on Zoom, or later on YouTube, may our hearts be filled with thankfulness and with praise. May we join together to worship you. We commit this service to you now and ask that you will undertake and everything that is said and done here, it might be for your honour and for your glory. So continue with us and continue to accept our praise as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We understand now and I sing another song, and it's Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Now, I know there's a danger when we know these songs, we can just sing them. But let's try and imagine that God is here, that He is here by His Spirit. Just try and imagine the Lord Jesus sitting by your side. So as we sing this song, let's make it a song of, of praise, a song of contemplation, and a song that the Lord is here with us. So let's stand and sing, Be Still, for the presence of the Lord is here.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted Jesus prays in Gethsemane. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. Jesus was in Jerusalem with his disciples for the Passover. Passover was a festival that the Jewish people had celebrated since the time of Moses, when God brought his people out of Egypt. Jesus knew the time had come for him to die, as the scriptures had said long ago. So he went with his disciples to an olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go to pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he was very distressed and troubled. He asked them to stay with him and keep watch, meaning he wanted them to stay awake with him. He went a little farther on and prayed. He cried out, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened Jesus. Then Jesus prayed even harder and was suffering greatly. He went back to his disciples and they were all asleep. Uh -huh. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. And then Jesus left them again to pray, the same as he did before. He went back to the disciples after he had prayed and found them sleeping again. The disciples didn't know what to say. So Jesus went away a third time, praying the same things again. When he went back 
to his disciples, he said, go ahead and sleep. But look, the time has come for Judas, the disciple who was betraying Jesus, was coming with men to arrest Jesus. Judas showed them who Jesus was and they arrested him. Jesus was taken and put to death on a cross to save us from our sins. But three days later, he rose from the grave. Huh? Hey ah! He is alive. He stayed with his disciples for 40 days and then went to heaven. See ya. God then sent the Holy Spirit to be the helper as God's people go out and tell the good news of Jesus to all the people of the world. It's interesting, it ends by saying, tell the news to all the people in all the world. And certainly God has the whole world in his hands. So whatever the news might be, good, bad or indifferent, God is in control. He holds, holds, holds all things in his hands. And therefore he holds you and me in his hands, wherever we are. So let's stand and see. He's got the whole world in his hands. Thank you. John, sorry, <laughs> a few technical issues today. Um, so, I hope you've all seen the news sheet either online or on the paper version. So on Friday, New Life Viewer will be here during the week cutting back the vegetation and stuff that side of the church. But children and young people, and there don't seem to be many of you here today, um, on Friday, well, yeah, evening, 5.30 to 8, you have a barbecue and games evening, so I hope you'll have a lot of fun there. And over the back on Saturday, the um, Christian Education Project invite you to a barbecue. Um, 
they shared something on their Facebook site that they'd only had two people saying they were going, apart from the team, their families, the trustees, etc. So that's it, open to anyone who wants to go, but you do need to let them know either by emailing the office or letting me know so that they cater for enough people. And you'll see also that WWMS are seeking new trustees. So even if you can't be a trustee, it would be good if you prayed for Andrew and the trustees as they seek. Because it'd be really good if they got some more Christian trustees on board. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take up our offering now, and as we do so, I want you to sing the song Faith for One. As I said before, we can always call upon the Lord, and He will hear us as we cry. So we'll take up the offering, and please stand as we sing Faith for One. Father, we thank you that you have given us the greatest gift possible, and that is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, although we bring our gifts now, however they've been given, they are given with love, with our desire to see you honoured and glorified. We pray, Lord, that you will take these gifts now and use them. Use them the way that you want to be used. May they be used, Lord, in proclaiming your gospel. 
may be used in encouragement of your servants as we seek to serve you day by day. And bless us, Lord, as we go out into this new week that we will take the good news of Jesus with us there, that they too might receive the gift of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. So accept these gifts and bless them, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A prayer of David. Lord, hear me because I ask for what is right. Listen to my cry for help. Hear my prayer. It doesn't come from lips that tell lies. When you hand down your sentence, may it be in my favor. May your eyes see what is right. Look deep down into my heart. Study me carefully at night and test me. You won't find anything wrong. I have planned nothing evil. My mouth has not said sinful things. Though evil people try to pay me to do wrong, I have not done what they wanted. Instead, I have done what you commanded. My steps have stayed on your paths. My feet have not slipped. My God, I call out to you because you will answer me. Listen to me, hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love. By using your great power, you save those who go to you for safety from their enemies. Take good care of me, just as you will take care of your own eyes. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Save me from the sinful people who want to destroy me. Save me from my deadly enemies who are all around me. They make their hearts hard and stubborn. Their mouths speak with pride. They have tracked me down. They are all around me. Their eyes watch for a chance to throw me to the ground. They are like a hungry lion waiting to attack. They are like a powerful lion hiding in the bushes. Lord, rise up. Oppose them and bring them down. With your sword, save me from those evil people. Lord, by your power, save me from people like that. They belong to this world. They get their reward in this life. May what you have stored up for evil people fill their bellies. May the children's stomachs be filled with it. And may there, be, and may there even be leftovers for their little ones. You will show that I am right. I will enjoy your blessing. When I wake up, I will be satisfied because I was saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to prayer. Let's pray again. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. We pray thee that we are your adopted children. And although you are so great and mighty and high and lifted up, you hear our cry. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our praises, with our thanksgiving. We thank you, too, that we can come with our needs and our concerns and our worry. And we thank you, too, Father, that we can pray for one another. And Father, you know who's in our fellowship who are unwell. You know their need, you know their situation. If they're in hospital, we thank you that you will give wisdom and guidance to the doctors and the nurses, that their treatment might be successful, that they will feel your presence with them, that they may recover 
and join us back here in the services very soon. We think of those, Lord, who used to worship here but can't now because of that old age and infirmities. We pray you will bless them in their homes where they are. We pray that they too may feel your presence. Just because they're not here, Lord, it doesn't mean they're forgotten, but you know them, you love them, you care for them. And in their infirmities, we ask you will meet their needs, give them peace, give them comfort. May they find where they're living others who love you, they can have fellowship together. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon them. And Lord, we wouldn't want to be selfish and just think of ourselves. But Lord, as we look out into the world, Lord, we, we do look with horror. Lord, we think of so many situations where there's so much war and pain and agony and death. Lord, we pray for those who are facing these sort of problems. We ask, Father, that you might be their peace. Comfort them in their distress and in their pain and in their sorrow. Lord, we ask that you will lift them up. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who are seeking to bring peace to such situations. Grant them success, Father, we pray. Even though the opposition may be daunting and their efforts might be crushed time and time again, but help them to, to persist in strengthening and guiding by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that through these situations, bad and as terrible as they may be, you may bring good out of it. Because you are in the world. You do hold the world in your hands. And Lord, we come to you. Lord, we might feel helpless ourselves. But Lord, you are our Heavenly Father. And so we pray that you will be with us. We ask that you might be with those who are on holiday, that they may have a good time together. That they may come back refreshed and renewed in body, mind and in spirit. With that in mind, we do pray especially for Andrew and Caroline and the family. We thank you for them. We thank you for their love for you and their desire to serve you here in Broadway. So we pray that Andrew comes back this week. You will be with him, give him wisdom in all his decisions, give him strength in all his activities and sustain him and Caroline. And bless their children, Daniel, Hannah and Zach as well. Meet their needs, Father, we pray. And so we thank you now, as we come to your word, that you will open it up to us. We thank you, Lord, that you always have things to teach us, to remind us of, or to show us fresh things. So bless us and guide us around your word, we pray, as we ask all these things now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of this psalm is a psalm of David, or simply, simply a prayer of David, I should say. Now, we can't place to the specific situation that is mentioned in this prayer, because there are so many of them, uh, but it connects with his general circumstances. But this psalm is quite remarkable in three ways. It is complete trust in God his Father and the lack of confidence he had in himself, and of the assurance of a glorious heavenly hope one day. And I believe that there are a number of things that we can learn from this psalm. For we all go through times of difficulty, hardship, and don't know sometimes which way to turn. So the first question is, what do I do in times of trouble? Well, I can only speak for myself. But I find sometimes I feel confident. I can solve this problem myself. Sometimes I'm successful, but more often than not, I'm not. And then I think, well, maybe it would be a good idea if I ask God to help me. And He does. But there are other times when I immediately come to Him in prayer. But I think to myself, well, then why should God answer me? Why should this holy God? answer me. And I believe there are a number of things, and I believe there are a, uh, that we find the key to this in the first verse of the psalm. O oh Lord, my righteous plea, listen to my cry. When we become Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are taken away, and we read in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, 
God says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That means that we can have complete confidence in God and he gives ear to our prayer. But it does not come from deceitful lips because we do love the Lord even though we make mistakes. Or again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We are presented before God as holy and perfect by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The old way has gone. The way we want to live has passed. We're on a new road. We're going in a completely different direction. We're going in the way that God wants us to go. And the work of perfection in us has started. And it will be completed one day when we're with the Lord in glory. And God longs and longs to bless us. I want you to remember that. God loves you so much. He longs to bless you. Therefore, we need to come to him in humility, in repentance, reverently, and perhaps the hardest thing of all, wait upon the Lord. What do I do in times of trouble? Come to him in humility, confessing we need help. Come repentance and nothing in us will mar that relationship. Come reverently before him, recognising who he is, and wait upon the Lord. How, how difficult it is in a world of rush and terror. Secondly, how does God want me to live? We expect God to respond to our cries, but as our Heavenly Father, and we are his children, he expects something from us as well. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, we read these words. After removing Saul, he made David the king. God said to him, I have David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. But hang on a minute. David wasn't perfect in any sense of the world. Yes, he had his heights of praise and worship, and he danced before the Lord when the ark returned. But then didn't he have that, didn't he arrange for one of his most faithful servants to be killed in battle? So he could take that man's wife for himself and commit adultery. Yes, David had his heights and lows. He had his roller coaster alive. And I guess that you and I have the same. We have our ups and we have our downs. That despite all that, despite his ups and downs, he had a heart for God. Psalm 25, verse 11 tells us, For the sake of your name, my Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Repentance. And isn't that what David did when he lost his child through the adultery? He repented of his sins. And that's what we need to do as well, repent from our sins. Psalm 27 and verse 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We need to trust in the Lord, as David did. And then Psalm 18, verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. We need to love the Lord. What does the Lord expect from us? We come to him in repentance, to trust him, and to serve and love him. God knows us through and through. He knows that we love him, even when we make mistakes. So we can, as David said, in verse 3, he says this, Though you probe my heart and examine me at night, though you test me, you will find nothing. I have resolved that my mouth will not sin. So we need to have faith in God. God is our Heavenly Father, and we are his adopted children. Romans 8, verse 17 says this, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now I guess most of us, we like the first part of that, 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 that uh, verse. We are now children, heirs of him, and heirs of God. 
and heirs of the prize, if indeed we share in his suffering. Let's be honest, none of us like suffering. Suffering comes sometimes because we make our own mistakes and we bring it upon ourselves. But very often suffering comes because we're Christians, because we're seeking to serve the Lord, and Satan will do all he can to stop us. And that's why our suffering comes sometimes. And God knows our weaknesses and the dangers of falling and slipping at any time. So we need God to hold us and so we will not slip. That means we have to put our trust, faith in him as verse, five, as verse 5 tells us. My steps have held to your paths, my feet have not slipped. Spurgeon once said this, <clears throat> what? Slip on God's highway? Yes, the road is, is good, but our feet are evil, and therefore slip even on the king's highway. So like David, we can at any time call upon the Lord, as he does in verse 6. I call to you, O God, for you will answer me, give ear to me, and hear my prayer. Now remember, David is a very dangerous situation. People want to kill him. They want to put him to death. But he still has the confidence that whatever his situation is, God is with him and God will hear his cry. He has faith in God. So let me ask you, what sort of God do you know? Our God is not made of wood or stone or covered in precious stones, which has, has to be made by man. A God that cannot move, a God that cannot speak, a God that cannot think. Our God is the true God, as we are reminded in verses 7 and 8 of this psalm. Show the wonders of your great love, you who save by your right hand. Those who take refuge in you from their foe, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. That is, that's what is God's great love? It is, as Romans 6, verse 8, 5, verse 8 tells us, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. There was a time when we were far from God, deserving God's anger and his judgment. Instead of that, he sent his one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be punished in our place by dying on a cross and three days rising again victorious, so that we as sinners, we may be forgiven, accepted by God, and take refuge in him. And that makes us very special. As it says in verse 8, we are the apple of his eye. And there is no other God like that. This is confirmation that God will hide me in the shadow of his wings. Just like a hen puts her wings out and her chick come under it, they find safety, they find protection, closeness and dependence. And again I say to you, there is no other God like that except our God, our Heavenly Father. But you see, it's only now after focus upon God, who he is, what he has done, how much God loves him, does David actually turn to his need? He tells God his need very clearly and very exactly in um, in verses seven to nine to twelve, sorry. For the wicked who assail me, for my mortal enemies who surround me. They close up their callous hearts. Their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down. They now surround me. Their eyes are alert to throw me to the ground. They're like a lion hungry for prey, like a great lion crouching in cover. David is very honest with God, and we also need to be honest with God when we come to him with problems. If we think God lets down, tell him. If we think we're hard done by, tell him. 
If you think it's not wrong, then tell him. But tell him how we feel, tell him how we see it. Because God understands, he knows already, and he loves us. And he will acknowledge that God can help us in our need. Joshua had many enemies as he was leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And in Joshua 1, verse, verse 9, we read these words. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now notice, that is not a request from God, that is a command from God. And what did he command you? He commands you to be strong. He commands you to be courageous. He commands you not to be terrified. He commands you not to be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord God is with you. You are on the victory side. And let's make that a God promise for yourself. Joshua 1 verse 8. That God is with us wherever we go. That's the sort of God that we have. I want to remind you that we are on the victory side. There are those who will belittle us. There are those who will make fun of us. There are those who would cause us to fall and fall away. As it says in verse 10, they close up their callous hearts and their mouths speak with anger beliefs. They know nothing of God. We may be surrounded and situations might seem hopeless to us. As we read in verse 11 and 12, of the psalm. They have trapped me down, they now surround me. Their eyes alert to throw me to the ground. They are like a lion, hungry for prey, like a great lion crouching in cover. We too may seem surrounded and the situation might be helpless. But just for a minute I want to turn to the Exodus chapter 14. Uh, Moses, by under God, had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They'd gone through the desert, and now here they were, faced with the Red Sea in front of them. They hadn't got boats, they couldn't swim, they had too much with them. They stopped. And they knew that uh, Pharaoh had changed his mind, and he wanted these children of Israel back to be his servants and to be his slaves. And he sent his army after them. So the children of Israel couldn't turn back because the Egyptians were coming after them. They were stuck in the impossible situation. <laughs> and the children of Israel did what probably often both of us do. <laughs> they complained. But listen to what Moses says to them. You've heard these words before. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And it was as the children of Israel, the priests, stepped into the Red Sea, that God parted the Red Sea. All the children of Israel walked through on dry ground. The Egyptians, thinking they had them at their mercy, rushed in after them. And God poured the waters on them, and they were utterly destroyed. You see, nothing is impossible with God. What we have to do is to trust, to wait, and not rush ahead. And if God can save me from my sins, and he can certainly bring me through any problems that I might face. I can't pay for my sins. I can't forgive my own sins. Only God. As I say, if he can do that, then God can do anything that I might face in my life. And remember that David's problems have not gone away, yet as he reads in verse 14, O Lord, by your hand save me from such men, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. You steal the hunger of those you cherish, their sons are plenty, and they store up wealth for their children. This is an amazing verse, and it says, And I, as for me, those who would oppose us 
look only to this life and not eternity. They have only the hope that this world can offer. They have no thought of the coming judgment of God that will come one day. But for David, he comes and says, I will see your face in righteousness. We are made righteous by the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our sins are washed away and remembered no more. The righteousness is a gift from God. It's not something we can earn, it's a gift from God. And now comes this amazing truth, and he says in verse 15, when I awake, I will be satisfied. David knew that the transition from this earth to heaven was like waking up. He knew that the world with God was far more uh, real and less dreamlike than this present life. So does not all our trials and tribulations that we face are nothing as compared to the waking of the glory that awaits us. I think that's a reminder that the preparation for eternal life begins here and now. And then we come to our final goal. Our trials are beginning and the process becomes more perfect. We become more perfect in Christ. Now I want you just for a moment, I'm going to read some verses from, from Revelation. And I want you, as I read it, to try and imagine in your mind eye the picture that is described there. what it says. After this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also, before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Now, I don't know if you had any images that might have come to your mind as I read that, but whatever it was, it would be nothing compared to the reality of one day being with the Lord in heaven. So I want to say to you, whatever you might face in the coming weeks and months, you're not on your own. God is with you. And also he has given us and blessed us with this fellowship here at Broadway that we can pray for and care for one another. But we must also think what I feel. We must pray for our government. And a government for a few weeks that God will guide them, that they will seek God's wisdom and not their own, that they may govern with fairness for all, that we might think of those in the whole world that God will work in their lives too. So while some of us are suffering, the rest of us can be praying for them. And then when it's our turn to suffer, if you like, they can be praying for us. That it may be said in this fellowship, see how those Christians love one another. So I pray that this may be our experience. For whatever situation we face, God is with us. Nothing is impossible to God. We need to trust him and let him take control. So what do I do in times of trouble? How does God want me to live? Have faith in God. What sort of God do we know? Tell God your need. We are on the victory side. Don't let Satan tell you anything else. We are on the victory side. And we have a glorious final hope that one day we shall be with him in glory. Amen.
We're going to sing our final hymn, <clears throat> and it's because he lives. And I think that the song speaks for itself. So it's because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Thank you. We can face today. We can face, Lord, whatever comes our way, because you are with us. We can call upon you, and you will answer our prayer. But help us to remember, Lord, that sometimes the way we want you to answer our prayer is not your way. But your ways is best. Your ways is perfect. So we pray, Lord, that we might be encouraged. You know what we face in this coming week. May you be our help. 
May you be our strength. May you be our guide. And may we be faithful witnesses that other people may see Jesus in us and want to know him for themselves. That they too may have life and know that they can face the future too in Christ. So continue with and bless us, we pray, as we ask these things in Jesus' name. And can we now say the grace together? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the mercy of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen.